So I'd like to open this with a quote from the Sufi poet, Rumi, that you're probably familiar with. Your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. Tonight's talk will be a little bit around that. Because so much of what we do here is not just generating the feeling of love. I, you know, one of the things that we notice first thing when there is problems with the love, problems with bringing up the feeling, is not because there's an actual problem with the love, is that there's things hindering it around it. There's barriers, there's things that are happening in someone's life or um, that have been gathered and locked around the heart, basically. In uh, acupressure, in fact, uh, this, uh, I was very interested in traditional Chinese medicine and acupressure also, and most specifically. And this is a principle we call armoring. And the emotional distress that we experience, we also lock within our body. And this is what kind of acupressure or acupuncture also, but mostly acu acupressure uh, aims at doing is to release that armoring, basically, uh, understanding how that works. And uh, some people that have accumulated a lot of, uh, a lot of emotional baggage uh, uh, throughout their lives and haven't learned how to let go, forgive, and to accept uh, will be very, very, very tensed. I've, uh, usually uh, when you do uh, acupressure on, on someone, Usually, I would say 90-95% of the time, uh, you can find your way through the tension patterns uh, in the body, in the nadis or the, the meridians. And uh, usually you'll apply just enough pressure to bring some awareness into the body, basically, so that there is a connection with the person's body and the mind. And basically acting as a, a, a third person in this and just um, applying a little bit of pressure and then there's a, a release that happens. And then you can usually feel, first you'll feel your fingers go in after maybe like 30 seconds, the, the fingers go in because there's a release that happens. There's a, venerable was my, latest patient <laughs> and uh, usually you'll feel the chi flow starting again so you'll feel a pulse but it's not it's not the it's not the heart pulse it's the chi pulse which are really close but not exactly the same but with people that have accumulated an armor basically for a long time without letting go uh, uh, it's happened that I, I could spend um, <laughs> a whole session trying to uh, basically going around, uh, starting from this central area and releasing everywhere around. And then, well, it doesn't really work because it's so much tension, uh, then you have to kind of go and do it again. And then a third time, and then at the fourth time, then there would be a sign of okay, it's, it's going in a little bit. And then there would be a, a release happening. And so everybody's different, of course. Uh, we, all, uh, we all have different ways of dealing and storing our emotions and our trauma, basically. Uh, but it's just a really interesting uh, principle to be aware of. And I thought this, uh, this quote was quite, uh, quite well said. A lot of the time, it's only a matter of uh, identifying what is hindering us, what is blocking us, what we have put in our own way, basically. 
And then the rest, when that comes out, uh, I've given a lot of uh, forgiveness meditation instructions today on interviews, which is really good because this is uh, what is needed to really clear up the path, really open up everything. And uh, uh, it goes quite deep and it's, uh, it's, it's something that is really helpful uh, for the further uh, steps that are to come in this practice. And sometimes just spending one or two days doing the forgiveness will, you know, so, somebody could spend the rest of the retreat trying to bring up love but not being able to, and then we'll do only, would only need to do one day or two of forgiveness and then everything will just happen naturally, very quickly, in fact. Uh, I spent a year and a half to two years doing forgiveness practice, so <laughs> one or two days is not that bad. <laughs> um, and I had to find my own way through it. This was before I encountered this teaching and Bhante Vimalaramsi's uh, approach to it, which is quite wonderful also. Uh, but I've developed, I had to develop my own tools uh, around it, so... And just quickly, like this, um, what do you think would be uh, barriers to the love? I gotta make this interactive, I can't just be talking all the time. <laughs> Pain. Pain. Pain, yeah, yeah, that would, that would, that would work. <laughs> yes, Samir. Greed. Greed, yes, very good. Ah. Oh, guilt, oh yes. Good, yes, yes, very, very much, very much guilt or remorse, maybe. Yeah. Yes, yeah, definitely, yeah. Hmm? Fear. Fear. fear, oh, fear, yes, uh, yes, yes, very good, yes, fear, yes. Mm -hmm. Anger, yes, yes, anger, very good, very good, yeah. And s any, anybody else? <laughs> doubt. doubt, yes, very Shame. well. Shame, yes, yes. Mm. Sometimes not, not feeling loved. Not feeling loved, yes. That was uh, my mom's, when, when she read my book, uh, Open Heart, uh, I have all these like troubleshooting love, basically. And the last one is, uh, you are loved. And then uh, something about like, there's, there's people in this world that practice uh, unconditional love, so you're, you are loved <laughs> by some people. <laughs> and uh, for her, that was the, the most helpful thing. So anyways. Yes, so basically, uh, there, there's, there's a lot. There, there, there's quite a lot of barriers that exist out there, uh, but I think we've, we've gone through all the main ones. Usually, um, at the root of it, uh, you've probably heard this before, greed, hate, and delusion. Have you ever heard this? Greed, hate, and delusion. That's pretty classic uh, Buddhist understanding. Yeah, you got a few nods. Yeah, okay. Um, what I would say, like, more um, simply just wanting all the time, uh, not being okay with what is. So. Always wanting all the time would be greed. <laughs> Not being okay with what is would be kind of anger or aversion or hate. And um, delusion would be just like uh, having a hard time understanding how things work. <laughs> That's how I would translate it. But um, in uh, Buddhist iconography, in certain traditions, uh, this has come to be uh, depicted as uh, the monkey, the snake, and the chicken, basically. So when you see these, uh, uh, that art depicted, that's, that's what it means. Um, I know it's kind of, uh, how do you say, like... Uh, Racist, but for animals. <laughs> yes, 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 kind of thing. 
stereotyping or like yeah animal animalism <laughs> 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 but i uh, i i just thought i would um, have a i had a few a few st interesting stories about that but um i just spent a whole year in sri lanka in the forest basically so i i only came out uh, like four months ago uh, to go to Bodh Gaya, the first retreat. And uh, so one day I was uh, coming back from alms round, so my, my kuti is about 20 minutes in, in the jungle. Um, and uh, I'm coming back from alms, I have a full bowl and uh, put it on the, put it on my, I, I built this kuti in the, in the jungle and then uh, there was like this building table that I was using for like cutting things and I just put my, my bowl on the table there and uh, I don't know what I did. I just went somewhere on my, a little bit further and then I came back and there was this monkey. <laughs> and this monkey on my bowl and he was just like going at it like hand after hand and just like put it in his mouth and just eating my lunch. So, <laughs> I mean, yeah, maybe it's... Not that bad of a... <laughs> yeah, maybe monkeys can be... <laughs> a little bit wanting. And uh, stories about snakes. I mean, um, there's a few, but uh, one that struck me as quite funny was that uh, I, every, every day at four, I would go around the, the Wewa, the lake, and because um, I like to walk there in the sunset especially. And... Um, this, uh, I'm walking barefoot and it's like a dirt road and uh, I see that it's all elephant grass on both sides and uh, I see this uh, really bright green snake, it's quite big, coming across and it's seeing me and it's looking at me and then a lot of snakes, you know, they're, they're not necessarily angry but they have an angry face, <laughs> so you never really know, <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> What is it saying here? And so, of course, I'm sending metta, but, uh, you know, that there's only, you know, you never all, <laughs> oh, you have to be really good at it to really know that it's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be a Buddha or something. <laughs> but <laughs> karma happens in, in, in its ways, in its mysterious ways. And there's this very happy Sri Lankan person who's just like missing a few teeth but he's really happy and he's just like smiling on his bike and he's just like pedaling on his bike and uh, he doesn't even see the snake that's looking at me and he's just like looking at me because they're really happy to see usually white monks Sudu Hamuduru uh, in, in Singhala and, um, and so he's looking at me he's like super happy and then he just like rolls on the, the snake and the snake is like whoa <laughs> just like goes into the grass <laughs> so it was a really funny scene to like the snake looking at me this person who's like really happy on his bike just like rolling on the snake <laughs> not even noticing so I thought it was like a really good um, kind of metaphor for our practice you know like when you have like anger coming across your road and you just like roll on it with your joy bike basically <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, yeah, and what about chickens? Well, then I... I have a chicken story. Oh, you have a chicken story. It's not as good as yours, but <laughs> I think it makes chicken delusion, right? Yes. So I was working on a farm in Chile, and they had these chickens that uh, they would lay little blue eggs, which were actually, we were told they were the healthiest eggs in the world. It was like tiny little blue things. They looked nothing like the uh, supermarket eggs. But uh, these chickens weren't very smart, is what I figured out. <laughs> and one example was they were in this garden area where we were trying to clear it out so we could... Uh, well, the chickens just weren't supposed to be in there eating things, and we were doing some work in there. So we were trying to clear out the chickens, and I had this uh, pitchfork, basically. It had some spikes on the end of it, and we were trying to kind of you know, like lure them towards the door. Um, but the chicken would just run right into the spikes. It wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't go the other, it didn't know how to turn around and go the other direction. 
So it, I just felt very cruel, I had to stop using it. But I guess this is kind of delusion, right? You run right into the spikes. You don't realize there's another way. That's awesome. I was missing the chicken story, and there you go. See, that's what happens. That's great. Good. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And so tonight's talk is a little bit uh, an expansion of what we touched upon yesterday. Um, this is going to be our first long, real sutta. Well, long. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, our first complete sutta, basically yesterday was little bribes here and there uh, that I picked up for bringing up s specific things, but now uh, tonight uh, is, a, is a complete discourse. And um, it's actually a remix. Uh, I'm just going to mix two suttas together so that it's uh, more complete. And this is discerning thoughts into two. Basically, this is Majjhima Nikaya number 19. And I like this story particularly because the talk is going to be about uncovering the path, basically. And this is uh, a little bit of an insight on the bodhisattvas, the bodhisattvas, uh, basically uh, Siddhartha Gautama. Uh, his uh, quest uh, to awakening and what he discovered. And I also thought this was a really fitting uh, kind of a discourse because being in this uh, beautiful place, Buddhapada, which uh, is uh, very close to, uh, well, uh, Tibetan Buddhism and Mahayana, and uh, I like to try to bridge uh, the gap between our two traditions uh, being from more early Buddhism. I thought, because one of the things that is really uh, marked between the two is that Mahayana and Vajrayana ideal are mostly towards uh, Bodhisattva ideals, basically becoming, becoming a Buddha, and that takes a very long time. Whereas early Buddhism or Theravada Buddhism is known to be a more like a, like a like a direct path to awakening kind of thing. We're not necessarily wanting to become a Buddha, but just becoming an arahant, basically, uh, an awakened person. So, personally, I think whether you want to be a Buddha or you want to be an arahant, I think it's great. <laughs> I'm not going to discriminate between the two. I think it's just beautiful either way, so great, good. <laughs> Uh, and just speaking of the Bodhisattva, as basically this is kind of like our Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, uh, when he was still on his quest to awakening, what he went through, the understandings that he went through to actually reach full Buddhahood. And that's quite, quite, quite important for us to understand. And uh, in our own path, like, what's the awakening of the Buddha? Like, what does it mean? Like, what, what's meditation? Where does it come from? It's really, it's really good and nourishing for our own practice to know these things. And so, obviously this talks about bhavana, wholesome mental development, letting go of unwholesome states, greed, hate and delusion, uh, and cultivating their opposite, non-greed, non-hate, non-delusion. And what would be non-greed? Generosity, yes, very good. And this is also known as kama and nikkama. Yeah, so uh, the sense desires and also um, relinquishing those sense desires, finding happiness within. Uh, and then non anger. Yes, compassion, loving kindness, very well. And then delusion would be. Wisdom, yes, wisdom. Mm -hmm. Okay, so without further ado, for you tonight, discerning thoughts into two. Thus have I heard. One time the awakened one was living in Jeta's grove at Anatta Pindika's monastery. There the awakened one addressed the monks, saying, Monks, Badhante, the monks replied. Badhante is just a name for the Buddha that the, the monks used. 
the Awakened One said this, Before my complete awakening, monks, while I was still a bodhisattva, not yet fully awakened, I reflected, let me meditate, discerning and dividing my thoughts into two. From then on, monks, I gathered on one side thoughts of sensory desires, thoughts of anger, and thoughts of harm. Or I like here in this particular sutta to translate this as agitation or restlessness, because this is also very close. And I gathered on the other side thoughts of letting go, thoughts of non-anger or loving kindness, and thoughts of calm, ease, and contentment. Then while I was meditating, attentive, intent, and resolute, there arose thoughts of sensory desires in my mind. Then I reflected, is that familiar? Somebody had a thought of ice cream today? Uh, <laughs> or maybe uh, tea? <laughs> Good, okay. So that's what that means, if we put it in a real context. Then I reflected, this is troublesome. This is troublesome to others and this is troublesome to both. These thoughts impede conscious discernment. When we're with these thoughts, we're kind of, we're not really here, we're kind of flowing out. They come with tension in the mind and they lead away from peace. As soon as I realized this, that these are troublesome, they faded away. So this is the power of wisdom also. When we realize that something is troublesome, when you put your hand on a really hot stove, are you going to put it there again? <laughs> no. So when we learn to see these states as they actually are, as painful, as unwholesome for us, then we're not likely to touch them again. We're just going to let them go. So I kept on letting go thoughts of sensory desires as they arose. I kept on releasing them and bringing them to an end. Then while I was meditating, attentive, intent and resolute, there arose thoughts of anger in my mind. Then I reflected, this is troublesome. This is troublesome to others and this is troublesome to both. These thoughts impede conscious discernment. They come with tension in the mind and they lead away from peace. As soon as I realized this is troublesome, they faded away. So I kept on letting go thoughts of anger as they arose, kept on releasing them and bringing them to an end. So this is our practice all the time, washing those away. Then, while I was meditating, attentive, intent, and resolute, thoughts of agitation arose in my mind. Then I reflected, this is troublesome. And as soon as I realized that this was troublesome, they faded away. So this is how it helps us let them go. So I kept on letting go thoughts of agitation or restlessness as they arose kept on releasing them and bringing them to an end. Now the inclination of the mind, now all of these, they kind of bring our mind in a certain direction as we accumulate those. Whatever one frequently thinks and reflects upon over and over again, this becomes the inclination of the mind. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of sensory desires, that person has left the thought of letting go to cultivate the thought of sensory desire. Their mind is bent upon sensory desire. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of anger, that person has left the thoughts of non-anger or love to cultivate thoughts of anger. Their mind is bent upon anger. 
seeing that touches upon yesterday's talk, when we have the loving kindness, when we're fully dedicated to the loving kindness, there is no unwholesome states in the mind. And that's just as clear as that. When there's one, there's not the other. When there's the other, there's not the other one. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of restlessness or restless thoughts, that person uh, has left thoughts of calm to cultivate restlessness. Their mind is bent upon restlessness. Just as in the last month of the monsoon season, in the late fall when the crops are abundant, a cow herd would have to protect his cows. To do so, he would have to poke and push, pull and block his cows in line this way and that way with a stick. Why? Because he sees that as the leader of these cows, he could be punished, imprisoned, fined or blamed if the cows were just to go and eat all the crop, basically. In the same way, monks, I saw danger, degradation, and defilement in unwholesome mental states. And in wholesome mental states, I saw freedom, benefit, and natural clarity. So here is a very important distinction. distinction. So it's the same thing when we have unwholesome states in our minds. We have to, to make a particularly um, definite effort uh, to restrain ourselves because this is when uh, we take uh, not really uh, smart actions. <laughs> this is when we can react to certain events and uh, in, in unwholesome ways, basically. And so we have to really check ourselves, restrain ourselves. And this basically just adds on to already what is there. Basically now th this, is the, this is kind of like an armoring process times two, basically. So this is how it works. Then while I was meditating attentive, intent and resolute, there arose thoughts of renunciation or letting go in my mind. Then I reflected, this is not troublesome. It is not troublesome to others, and it is not troublesome to both. These thoughts are for the growth of conscious discernment. They bring no tension in the mind, and they lead to peace. I reflected, if I were to think about and dwell in these thoughts at night, I see nothing to fear that could arise from this. So these thoughts of letting go are fully blameless, they're not harmful. If I were to think about and dwell in these thoughts during the day, I see nothing to fear that could arise from this. Then I reflected, if I were to think and reflect constantly, before long my body would become exhausted. With an exhausted body, the mind is unsettled. An unsettled mind is far from collected harmony, samadhi, basically. I then calmed my mind and gathered it on itself. I unified it and brought it to peaceful harmony, to collectedness. Why? So that my mind be undistracted. And I've talked a little bit about this today to a few people on interviews. Uh, sometimes, uh, we, at a certain point, we will start to notice that constantly bringing up thoughts, even if they are wholesome, about, let's say, a spiritual friend, or about this or that, or a situation, a place, just the fact that we're thinking constantly at the beginning, we need it. We, it's a really wholesome thing to do. We bring up these uh, visual objects or mental objects in our mind to bring up the feeling, and we use it in a really wholesome way. But then, 
as we move along in the releasing process, then we also need to let go of these, uh, of these, this constant thinking, this constant churning of the mind. And letting go of the thinking is actually even more blissful. And th this is, uh, yesterday we talked about the whole way up to the first jhana, the first level of meditation. And now I'm introducing the second level of meditation, which has avitaka avichara, basically without thinking nor imagination or reflection. So even though this thinking and imagination is very wholesome at the beginning and it helps us, we use it basically to our advantage. Then after the next step is to actually let go of that and to allow space for only samadhi, basically. That collectedness of mind that will simply stand on itself. Although sometimes we can try to take a step too fast <laughs> and try to do that but we're not ready yet. So that's why it's important to have it gradually, to do it properly. And so that we don't end up trying to let go of all the visualization or the bringing up the thought or the friend or the dog or uh, last retreat we had uh, somebody whose uh, spiritual friend was a dolphin. So <laughs> that was great. <laughs> and so uh, even the dolphin uh, letting it go, but um, so to make sure that we're not um, we're not going too fast either, and that we're ready. The the meta is stabilized basically, and it's it's able to stand on itself. So, just taking our time here, and so he goes through the next uh, two stages, and he said he says the same thing basically about. Uh, Non-anger, which is not troublesome, and it brings to peace, and it brings to collective mental harmony. But if we were to constantly think about love or non-anger and all these things, then the mind would just be agitated still, even though it's wholesome. And then the same thing for uh, thoughts of contentment. Oh, I'm so content. Oh, I'm so content. <laughs> Repeating the, the how content you are, but, uh, or content I am, let's say. I'll just keep it on me. <laughs> and uh, basically, just repeating that would be just agitating the mind. And then the next step is to, okay, calming down that agitation of thinking. Now, wholesome inclinations. Whatever one frequently thinks about and reflects upon over and over again, this becomes the inclination of the mind. And today there was, um, I know I said this quote from Bruce Lee last night. Uh, <laughs> it, was mostly, uh, it was mostly to quote Bruce Lee in a Dhamma talk. But uh, <laughs> hopefully raise a few smiles. But um, I realized that uh, saying that uh, optimism is uh, the all in all of what we're doing it w wouldn't be very right. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that you should just be positive and override all, all the negative just by being positive and there's this movement out there that's trying to just be, you know, like just be positive all the time about everything. And sometimes it's also denying the fact that there can, there can be sadness, there can be uh, some problems and somebody is like basically trying to override that with just being uh, blindly positive, basically. And that's not what we're trying to do here. We're really trying to acknowledge whatever is, but we are trying to become alchemists of the heart, basically. And whatever unwholesome states that arise within us or in our immediate surroundings, the experience that we have, to take that, to accept it, to welcome it into our into our heart and to turn it into gold. And so not to, not to blindly trying to override it with positivity, but to acknowledge it, seeing with discernment and learn to turn it into a wholesome state, basically. 
uh, whenever and if it's really bad then you can just remain equanimous too you know you don't have to you know you don't have to like be like oh I love you so much for like I don't know, like slapping me in the face or, <laughs> I don't know, you know, you know, so when it gets to that level, you know, uh, of course there's a simile of the saw where the, the Buddha says even if you were to be cut limb, limb after limb by, uh, by, uh, uh, sav- uh, by some brigands, uh, you should still have loving kindness or compassion for them. Uh, yet there are other suttas where he says, you know, uh, when, when somebody like pushes the threshold of uh, certain boundaries of respect and you know mutual um, uh, mutual limits of respect, then uh, you can just also just remain equanimous <laughs> and just not, not uh, become like a Teflon pan and just let it let it drop. So we're not trying to uh, blindly override the negative by the positive. We're trying to turn it with discernment and wisdom to turn it, take it in and turn it and offer it back into gold, basically. That's what we're doing. Uh, yesterday I was talking about gardening and uh, one of the things that has been really helpful for me is that, um, you know, for, for a good garden to grow or if you want to have a really good crop, you need a lot of fertilizer, you need a lot of compost and compost is, <laughs> where does compost come from? Waste. Waste all the trash, <laughs> all the things that you don't want, that you want to you throw away, uh, cow dung, these are all the best fertilizers. And the more you have of that, the better your garden will be. And so it's really interesting. When you're a good gardener, you know that this junk is actually gold. And this is what we're doing also. We're being smart about these experiences and when we get very skilled at it everything that happens in our lives even if it's a hard time it's hardship it's it's not pleasant on the moment if you're smart you'll be able to take that experience and turn it into gold and it will actually at some point in your life it will come handy it will be an experience that you can use actually so there's never anything wasted in, in our experience. We just need to learn how to deal with it. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of letting go or renunciation, that person has left the thought of sensory desires to cultivate thoughts of letting go. Their mind is bent upon letting go. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of non-anger, or contentment or calm, that person has left the thought of agitation or restlessness. To cultivate thoughts of calm, their mind is bent upon calm. Just as if in the last month of the summer season, when all the crops have been harvested in the villages, a cowherd would keep an eye on his cows at the root of a tree in the open, only needing to be aware, there are the cows. In the same way, monks, I only needed to be aware, there are wholesome mental states. And see the difference between when we are wise with what we do with our mind, when there's only wholesome states, we don't need to worry about uh, what, what's happening, it's, it's wholesome, it's blameless, it's harmless, basically. So this, and I like to see this cowherd just like sitting at the root of the tree is like this mental collectedness. It's like all these, all the cows, all the states in the mind are wholesome. So it doesn't, it's fine, everything is fine. And you can just sit there and relax and enjoy the calm of meditation, basically. And this happens naturally. Then unrelenting, uncurbed, my determination was 
unconfused presence of mind came to be. So this is the wisdom, this is the practice, and now virya, we take it and we devote ourselves to that. We make it, we do it all the time. So you're staying with the love, staying with your spiritual friend, or whatever your object of meditation is, and constantly just being fully devoted to that. And then whenever there's a distraction arising, six aring, recognizing, release, relax, re smile. What is the next? Return. Return. Very good. Yeah. You're listening. <laughs> Repeat. Yes, yes. Very good. My body became calm and free from tension. My mind became collected and harmonious. And this is another way that the Buddha had to say, to, uh, to talk about this natural collectedness of mind, how it occurs. So basically we had uh, uh, the seven supports of awakening just lining up and happening right here. Then letting go of all sensory engagement, letting go of unwholesome mental states. Still attended by thinking and imagining with the blissful happiness born of letting go. One, I understood and abided in the first level of meditation. I immersed, permeated, suffused, and pervaded my body with the blissful happiness born of letting go. And nowhere in my body was left untouched by this blissful happiness born of letting go. Viveka jang piti sukkang. For the Pali geeks in the room. Imagine a skilled soap maker who would throw some soap powder into a copper bowl. At that time, soap was uh, slightly different than what we have today. <laughs> and you had to make it in a bowl. He would sprinkle it with water and knead it thoroughly. Then after some time, the lump of soap would be filled and suffused by moisture through and through, everywhere touched by the moisture. Yet it would not leak. So this joy suffuses the body, but the mind doesn't leak outside. In the same way one immerses, I immersed, permeated, suffused and pervaded my whole body with this blissful happiness born of letting go. With the calming of thinking and imagining, with inner calm, my mind became unified without thinking nor imagining. See, now we're moving into the second level of, second stage of meditation. With the blissful happiness born of mental collectedness. So the first level is characterized by this, just this blissful happiness that arises when we let go of all the senses and all the unwholesome states. There's this like really beautiful joy that is completely blameless that arises within. But samadhi isn't there yet. That mental collectedness is only a factor of the second level of meditation. So it's normal that it happens a little bit, a little bit further in the path. And when the mind becomes collected, then the, the blissful joy comes from this very beautiful stillness of the mind. Then I understood and dwelled in the second level of meditation. I immersed, permeated, suffused and pervaded my, my body with the blissful happiness born of mental collectedness. And nowhere in my entire body was left untouched by this blissful happiness born of mental collectedness. Imagine a deep lake with water only welling up from within. With no other source flowing in, not from the east, from the west, from the north or the south, and no rain at any other time. From that cool water spring gushing up from within, 
That is the joy. That lake would become immersed, permeated, suffused and pervaded by this fresh, cool water. And the lake is the body here. And nowhere in this entire lake would be left untouched by this cool spring water. And this works uh, better in India because uh, in Canada it's a cold country, so cool water doesn't seem so appealing, but here it's great. <laughs> in the heat of, of Bihar or something like that. With the calming of stronger joy, one abides in mental steadiness. So here, something that is sometimes misunderstood is that people say that the joy disappears at the third jhana, but it's not true. It fades down, it fades, it matures, and it, it becomes more settled. But it does not disappear. So this is, a, it, a, the Pali word is vupasama, which means it calms down. Present and fully aware, one abides in mental steadiness. Experience, it's experiencing ease or happiness within the body. A state which the awakened ones describe as steady presence of mind, this is a pleasant abiding. So does that sound joyful to you? <laughs> that sounds pretty pleasant to me anyways. I don't know about you guys, but yeah. One understands and abides in the third level of meditation, or I understood and abided in the third level of meditation. I then immersed, permeated, suffused, and pervaded my body with that ease beyond stronger joy. At this point, the more strong, the stronger joy is not as good as the beautiful poise that starts to arise in the mind. And that, that is much calmer, but much more steady and much more uh, enjoyable. And nowhere in my entire body was left untouched by the ease beyond stronger joy. Imagine water lilies, Indian lotuses and white lotuses. Some of these water lilies and lotuses are born in the water, grown in the water, not risen above the water, nourished while completely immersed. From their very tip down to their roots, submerged, permeated, suffused and pervaded by this cool water so that no part of those water lilies and, and lotuses is left untouched by the cool water. In the same way, I immersed, permeated, suffused, and pervaded my body with that ease beyond stronger joy. Then, unattached to pleasant experiences and unstirred by unpleasant ones, this means that the mind becomes very balanced, very balanced, very beautifully balanced, this poise. With the settling of excitement and disturbances, balanced in regards to all experience and sensations, purified by unmoving presence, one understands and abides in the fourth level. I understood and abided in the fourth level of meditation. I sat suffusing my body with the bright purity of this, of this spotless mind and nowhere in my body was left untouched by the bright purity of this spotless mind. Imagine a man or a woman was sitting wrapped up to the head with a sparkling white cloth so that nowhere on their entire body would be left untouched by this sparkling white cloth, sparkling white cloth of, the, of awareness. In the same way, I sat with my body suffused with that bright purity 
of my spotless mind. And nowhere in, in my body was left untouched by the bright purity of this spotless mind. Then I thoroughly under, undertook the skill of self-reflection. So this is taken from another sutta, which is called the fivefold wise collectedness, fivefold wise samadhi, basically. And then there is the four jhanas, and then right after there is this element of uh, reflection, looking back, looking at the mind, what it's doing, basically. And so whenever we are uh, practicing, if we, wherever we are in the levels of meditation, if we just look at the mind constantly and reflect like a mirror and see, oh, this is there, and this is there, this is not there, this is not there, then we can always make progress by ourselves. I gave proper attention to it, continually upholding it and rendered it intuitive through discernment. So basically, he was basically constantly looking at the state of his mind, how clear his mind was until, until, up until the end, basically. So here we have to make a decision. Okay, <laughs> Samir. Can I ask you know, yes, 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 please. Between the third and the fourth. Yes. yes. So basically, the third jhana is basically where um, the the stronger joy will start to calm down. It doesn't disappear, but it kind of it merges into a much greater um, mental stability, uh, equanimity basically. Uh, but the third jhana is just the beginning of that equanimity. The equanimity reaches full maturity in the fourth jhana, basically. That's the difference. The fourth jhana is like a very, uh, mm, very steady poise, basically. Very steady mind mm -hmm. that is not perturbed by all the senses. So we have to make a choice. Would you uh, hear um, there are, uh, there's the explanation of the three knowledges that the Buddha broke through uh, to his awakening. The knowledge of recollection of past lives, the knowledge of uh, um, beings and their, uh, their rebirth, basically had the destination of beings. And then the, the complete uh, fading away of all distractions, of all mental impurities. So I guess the question is, would you like to hear more about uh, recollecting past lives and uh, karma and rebirth, or we go straight to the core? You want to hear? Okay, good. Hey. Oh, yes? Okay, okay, good. Okay, very good. Everybody agrees? Nobody's going to go like, no. Okay, <laughs> good. Okay. So basically, as the mind gets uh, purified, now, now this is a, a bit of a leap, okay? So this is, it's not because you attain the, first, the four jhanas that um, <laughs> you're going to see your past life. <laughs> Just making that clear. Um, it takes a little bit more time. <laughs> you have to purify your mind a little bit more. But the Buddha explained things, you know, he, he had to like put it, like package it together so that people could take it and do like understand what he's talking about. So on the timeline, this would be, uh, this would be a few years, you know. <laughs> but here we are. And the mind has been purified by continually doing this, doing right effort, bringing up the seven supports of awakening, cultivating those and purifying the mind in the, like, through the jhanas, the levels of meditation. Then at some point the mind just loses all of its feathers, it, fetters, it, it starts to open up, it starts to unshackle. And things happen. There's certain knowledges that start to trickle in because the mind is so open, it's unimpeded. And now we can, someone can tap into uh, a vaster, a broader kind of knowledge. 
And so this is when recollecting past lives is possible, like uh, uh, seeing uh, non-human beings, the deva planes, the other realms of existence. And so this is what it's talking about here. With this composed and collected mind, wholly cleansed and purified, clear and open, rid of imperfections, having become pliant and malleable, straight and unwavering, I directed and inclined it to knowing and recollecting past lives. I then remembered countless previous lives like this, one birth, two births, three births, four births, five births, 10 births, 20 births, 30 births, 40 births, 50 births, a hundred births, a thousand births, a hundred thousand births. Countless eons of expansion, countless eons of contraction, countless eons of expansion and contraction of the universe. Seeing in that life, this was my name, this was my ancestry, my lineage. This was my appearance. This was my food. This was how I experienced pleasure and pain. And this is how I grew old. Passing away from there, I appeared elsewhere. In this other place, this was my name. This was my ancestry. This was my appearance. This was my food. This was how I experienced pleasure and pain. This is how I grew old. Passing away from there, I reappeared here. In this way, I realized, I recalled my countless past lives with their particular context and characteristics. This is the first understanding which I realized in the first part of the night. Blindness was driven out and clear understanding arose. Darkness was driven out and light arose, just as happens for one who meditates, attentive, intent, and resolute. With, the com with this composed and collected mind, which is wholly cleansed and purified, clear and open, rid of imperfections, having become pliant and malleable, straight and unwavering, I directed and inclined it to knowing and passing to the knowing and passing away and rebirth of beings. With the clarity of the cosmic sight, this is the Dibba Chakku, which goes beyond the human state. I saw beings passing away and reappearing, vile and excellent, well proportioned and disproportioned happy and miserable. I saw that beings fare on according to their actions. Clearly I saw living beings who were unrighteous in their physical actions, unrighteous in their verbal actions, unrighteous in their mental actions, who were disrespectful to the awakened sages, holding on to unwise opinions, and taking actions based upon unwise opinions. When they separated from their body after death, they reappeared in realm, the realms of the fallen, the realms of misery, the plains of ruin and destruction. Clearly I saw living beings who were virtuous in their physical, verbal and mental actions, who held the awakened sages in esteem endowed with wise understanding and who took action based upon wise understanding. When they separated from their bodies after death, they reappeared in the realms of bliss, the celestial abodes. With the clarity of the cosmic sight which goes beyond the human state, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, vile and excellent, well proportioned and disproportioned, happy and miserable, I saw that beings fare on according to their actions. This is the second understanding which I realized in the middle part of the night. 
Blindness was driven out and clear understanding arose. Darkness was driven out and light arose, just as happens for one who meditates, attentive, intent, and resolute. Now you might be wondering, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> but to understand karma uh, at the deepest level, uh, to really understand that, you know, what we do, what what happens with the actions that we do, what, you know, you can see that uh, if you uh, if you're violent with someone, then you're likely to they're likely to get violent with you as well. If you're kind to someone, they're very likely to be very kind with you. But to draw a really definite line and say like this is how it works is really hard because this is not that clear in this world. But the Buddha brought this to such an extent, such, such a depth, he even saw, he saw his own past lives and saw how it worked. And he saw how all living beings was the same through their actions, through their karma, basically. Uh, they were being dragged on to where, uh, to where their karma was bringing them, basically. This is why they uh, reaping the fruits of their actions, basically. And this is very important because uh, if there was no karma, then all of this would be in vain. There wouldn't be a path. There wouldn't be a way out. Uh, and the Buddha said, I wouldn't be teaching this. <laughs> if there was no karma, if there was no consequence of action, I wouldn't be teaching this. I would be just like meditating <laughs> or whatever. So this is very important. And this is at the core of the Buddha's awakening, understanding that the law of cause and effect, kama vipakka, basically, and how the purification process of the mind works. And now the last understanding with this composed and collected mind, wholly cleansed and purified, clear and open, rid of imperfections, having become pliant and malleable, straight and unwavering, I directed and inclined my mind to the complete calming of mental movements. And these are distractions, but at a certain point the mind is so clear and still that it's not really full-fledged distractions anymore, it's just a little you know, little waverings of the mind. I understood mental movements as they really are. This is tension. This is the increase of tension. This is the release from tension. And this is how or the path to release the tension. I understood mental movements as they really are. These are distractions. This is the increase of distractions. This is the release from distractions, and this is how to release distractions. And so the third one is usually the one that I use the most because this is applicable for us in our practice here and now. Wherever you're going to reach awakening tonight, or tomorrow, or in a few years, then this is really helpful to know anyways. Then continually observing and understanding in this way, seeing this distraction, causing tension, releasing them. And that's the path, continually doing this. My mind was released from the inclination for clinging outwardly, from the inclination of projecting in the future. Everybody familiar with that? <laughs> this is bhava tanha, but this is just the way that I render it. And from the inclination to negligence, in, the, in that release, one knows this is release. So often this is what happens. We can only imagine what release would feel like until we actually get there. And then we know, right, this is release. This is what the Buddha is talking about. And you don't need to be a narahant to know this. There are four uh, awakened People, the four Arya Pugalas, stream enterer, once returner, non returner, and arahant. 
and each of those technically would, to a certain degree, understand the path, the fourth noble truth, so that the understanding can be somewhat complete and have perfect confidence in the teaching, basically. I directly knew unwholesome states have been overcome. This is usually called birth. Birth has been overcome, or birth is des destroyed. Kina jati. But uh, I like to render it as a more practical, down to earth, uh, to our practice, and unwholesome states are just gone. They cannot arise anymore. Lived is the spiritual life, done is what should be done. There is no more conceit. Here. This is the third understanding which I realized on the last part of the night. Blindness was driven out and clear understanding arose. Darkness was driven out and light arose. Just as it happens for one who meditates attentive, intent, and resolute. Now, and this is why I called this uh, talk Uncovering the Path is because of this analogy here. Just as if there was a remote forest, a vast and extensive marsh on low-lying grounds, where would live and forage a great deer colony. Then some man would come intent on their ruin, intent on their harm, intent on capturing them. He would cover up the safe and free path to be traveled with joy. And he would open a deceptive path, set down a groom decoy, and bring up a domestic lure. Because of this, after some time, the great deer colony would be brought to ruin and decline. Then some man would appear, intent on their happiness intent on their welfare, intent on their liberation. He would clear up and reveal the safe path to be traveled with joy. And he would cover up the deceptive path, release the decoy and remove the lure. Because of this, after some time, the great deer colony would be brought to growth, prosperity and abundance. This story I just told you, monks, is to teach a lesson. Here's the meaning. The vast and extensive marsh on low-laying grounds, this is a designation for all sensory desires. The great deer colony, this is a designation for living beings. The men intent on their ruin, harm, and capture this is a designation for Mara and wickedness. The deceptive path is a designation for the unwise eight-spoke path, which is unwise understanding, unwise thinking, unwise speech, unwise behavior, unwise living, unwise practice, unwise awareness, and unwise meditation. The male decoy or the decoy, this is a designation for the happiness of craving, seeking happiness in wanting things. And the lure is a designation for lack of conscious discernment. The man intent on their happiness, welfare and liberation, this is a designation for the Tathagata, the truth finder worthy and perfectly all awakened, the safe and free path to be traveled with joy. This is a designation for the eight-spoke path of the awakened. That is wise understanding, wise thinking, wise speech, wise actions, wise living, wise practice, wise awareness, and wise meditation. This would usually be Right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, then right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. But I'm not a big fan of the word concentration.
as you notice. <laughs> Sorry? Attention, yes, also. Good. Monks or beautiful people that are meditating on this retreat. <laughs> I have reopened the safe and free path to be traveled with joy. And I have revealed and closed the deceptive path, released the male decoy and removed the lure. Monks, what should be done by a teacher for his students, holding their best interest at heart, out of loving compassion, that I have done for you now. There are these roots of trees, monks. There are these empty huts. Meditate, monks, do not be neglectful, lest you become remorseful when the time is past. This is my advice to you. This is what the Awakened One said. With an uplifted mind, the monks delighted in the Awakened One's words. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> okay. Very good. So now we've uncovered the happy path to be traveled with joy cleared out the brush and had a dip in the eight-spoke path. We first saw the discernment between wholesome states and unwholesome states. What we think about, what we constantly ponder upon, this becomes inclinations in the mind, becomes bhava, becomes habitual tendencies habit patterns. When they are wholesome, they are wholesome. When they are unwholesome, they are unwholesome. And they arise. And we saw how to choose between them, to choose the wholesome and to bring up the wholesome constantly. Bringing up the seven factors of awaken, awakening uh, through awareness, then directing this awareness to discerning these states, choosing, choosing the wholesome one, letting go of the unwholesome ones, and constantly doing this. This is virya, this is devotion, determination, effort. So basically we have sati, uh, dhamma, vichaya, and virya, which is doing that constantly. And when we do that, when we let go of unwholesome states, heavy, unbeneficial states, and choose wholesome states, then joy arises, piti, that is the fourth support of awakening. So naturally, when we do this, obviously there's going to be joy. Then when there is joy, there is pasadi comes to be, then it calms down. The mind gets purified and it becomes calm, and then it collects samadhi, that is the sixth. And when the mind is tranquil, joyful, peaceful, content, collected, it becomes very, very, very steady. It's not looking at wanting other things. It's very happy, content, and steady. And that is upekka, steadiness of mind. This is how I call it. And this steadiness of mind allows us to have a very clear awareness. So this feeds the circle, becomes sati again. So with the sati, we see states, we are able to discern states to a much more subtle degree and bring our practice to a much deeper level. So this is how the seven supports of awakening work. And then the four levels of meditation are simply a road map. What happens to the mind as we do this? And we saw the threefold knowledges that are at the root of the Buddha's awakening. So we're seeing all of the path right now and how he broke through to seeing, bringing right effort all the way to the end with uh, the Four Noble Truths. Seeing how distractions are tension and how their release is blissful. And then awakening. 
in which realm is Buddha now? Um, this is getting uh, <laughs> a little esoteric. I technically, from what I understand from the original uh, Pali text, is that when a Buddha um, enters Parinibbana, this, this is how we say a Buddha passes away or dies, is that they don't really die, they enter Parinibbana. So there is the breaking up of the aggregates, which is uh, Rupa, the body, and then um, uh, sensations, perceptions, uh, sankharas, thoughts, and then consciousness, vijnana. And then these aggregates, since there's no more craving, craving is like the glue that holds everything together. And since there's no more craving, there's nothing to hold these together anymore. And there's no karmic projection. There's no... So the Buddha himself never answered these questions. He would always say, uh, I haven't uh, answered these questions. <laughs> he would ask, uh, does, a Buddha, does a Buddha exist after death? Does he not exist after death? after death does he neither not exist exist nor not exist does he n not exist neither not exist anyways I'm not <laughs> and then he would say I haven't declared this <laughs> and I'm not going to because this doesn't lead to Nibbana it just needs to more proliferation basically of the mind I think it becomes clearer to s someone that does experience uh, the release that the Buddha taught to a certain level, then uh, the, these questions become a little bit clearer uh, in the sense of uh, understanding a mind that doesn't latch onto anything at all, basically. It, there's just nothing that to describe it, basically. There's nothing that... It's just completely gone. <laughs> gone out, Nibbana, that's what it means. <laughs> there was a question I saw, yes, okay, two questions. Yuri. When does one know if he or she is a retired? If? He or she is a retired. Oh, a once returner or a non-returner? A returner. Uh, yes. Once. So basically, uh, the Arya Pugala's work in a, sen in a way that uh, the, first, the first level, Sotapatti, uh, entering the stream of Dhamma, one lets go of, one understand it and understands the Dhamma to the depth at which one completely lets go of the false idea that there is a self, a permanent self or an entity. Uh, then uh, that's Sakaya Ditti, and then there is a uh, complete letting go of all rites and rituals, believing that rites and rituals lead to Nibbana, basically. Uh, that is uh, Sila Bhatta Paramasa. And then, uh, then doubt, doubt in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, that doubt in the teaching, basically. Uh, this is completely gone. Then once returner is. Um, somewhat vague <laughs> because uh, a stream enterer is known to only be able to take seven more rebirths, lifetimes, cannot take an eighth one before they attain Nibbana, like complete unbinding. Uh, but a once returner is said to only come back once, so that's what it means, and then it, they will attain Nibbana on that lifetime. And um, the, the fetters that are abandoned at that level is, um, they're not, that's the thing, is that they're not fully abandoned, they're greatly diminished, that's what it says. Like, so basically, uh, wanting like sensual desires is greatly diminished, and anger, impatience, is great, greatly diminished. So that, to the point where they, they will only take one more lifetime to gather the, the last bit of discernment that they need to, to break through. And then the non-returner is basically completely done with sensual desires and done with anger. So an anagami cannot, cannot be angry, cannot be impatient, and they cannot 
you know, like a crave for something at the, the senses. They can, they, they still understand that the body needs food, for example, and things like that, but they're not going to like have preferences or they're not going to, they're not going to really care about, you know, me, uh, TV programs or things like that. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, me, specific kind of chips. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's about it. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes. What is meant by your unknown quantification or unknown relationship? <laughs> well, there there are uh, there there's a few answers to that. So. At the time of the Buddha and, and today, today still, um, there are ways of practicing, for example, mindfulness or like uh, awareness that are not um, that are not in line with the Eightfold Path, basically. That are not. Uh, I will actually address that question later in this retreat. With a discourse on the Mahajatta Risakka Sutta, the Great Forty States, which explains how uh, wise meditation comes about, and that is through the seven other folds of the path, basically. Um, this is quite quite a lengthy topic in itself, so maybe I could try to answer that more in the. <laughs> we actually were talking about that the other day. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think... Uh, well, the answer that we came up with is that a psychopath... <laughs> cannot experience real empathy or compassion or love. They're going to be really good at faking it, though. <laughs> So that's where the problem is, and that's why it's they're really interesting people. Uh, <laughs> sorry? Can't they have insights uh, without experiencing love and kindness of it? Like, uh, insight into the world. Uh, yeah, that's the <laughs> And remain psychopaths, like awakened psychopaths? And I, I have my doubts. <laughs> um, yeah, so the thing is that this is such a big topic and I could, like, I could dive into it, but, um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that, like, like I said, last retreat in Jetvan, for example, you know, what is, what is right mindfulness? For a long time, for me, I thought right mindfulness was to, like, really pinpoint down awareness, like, on a single point, and, like, I can, like, really look at that microphone really intensely. <laughs> and, I mean, just doing that, uh, Venerable has uh, this really interesting exercise uh, to, you can, like, Put your finger in front of you and like really look at the smallest point on your finger that you can choose and really try to isolate the smallest little part and really narrow down your whole vision onto that bit and then release it and take it all take in all the room It just feels so good. <laughs> you can feel the release like here and now really very vividly. Um, because doing this comes with a lot of tension. Yes, you can really control your awareness very well. And I used to do that a lot. That's that I practice concentration practices for many years. Um, and you can learn to do that and that's actually you don't need to hold the virtues to do that uh, you this this will bypass this will cut off all hindrances 
but it will also cut off all the virtues as you don't need to be virtuous to do this. You, of course, the virtues will help you because that's what virtues do. I mean, they're just going to help you in everything that you do. But if you choose to just like pin down your awareness, a psychopath can do that very easily. Actually, they're going to be really good at it probably. And so... Uh, is that is that wise? Is that really is? Are we talking about developing wholesome states, like the Buddha just talked about, like I've been talking about since the beginning of this retreat? Bhavana, cultivating wholesome states, abandoning unwholesome ones, uh, loving kindness, compassion, uh, sympathetic joy, calmness of mind, poise. It doesn't really tie into anything. It's just a different way of working with the mind. And at the time of the Buddha and, and now too, there are a bazillion ways of working with the mind that do not necessarily bring to the, to the same result. Yes? That's because the, the word bhavana and jhana or dhyan, um, uh, they, they are both usually translated as meditation, both of them. But there is a slight difference. So basically all I can say is to basically put it back in their context where you find them most often and how the Buddha used them. The word jhana would come under the, the, the four jhanas basically. This is where it comes up. And this is basically these four consecutive stages that the Buddha discovered, which he uses a lot to explain how he got there. Uh, they're just basically levels of meditation, and I like to call them uh, the roadmap of the mind, basically. Bhavana is more uh, kind of uh, all-inclusive of complete wholesome mental development. Yeah, it can be called meditation, but it's a bit more than that. So it, it involves right effort, right mindfulness, and it's, um, it's all, it also involves uh, basically um, the jhanas. So jhana would be in, in bhavana, basically. So, yeah. I, you know, there, there's a sila, samadhi, panya. But there's also dana sila bhavana. So there's these two. Uh -huh. Yeah. Good. I think where the confusion stems from is because also the word dhyana is more commonly used as meditation yes. in the Indian context. Yes. It's probably coming from Patanjali or yoga. Yes. So yeah. the word bhavana is more relevant in today's context. Yes. So, um, I like uh, Bhikkhu Sujato's interpretation of where uh, the, um, uh, the word jhana comes from, uh, which is probably because the Buddha knew, knew the Vedas. Uh, of course, there was a, a little bit less than, than we have today uh, with the Vedanta and, and all the rest. Uh, but uh, the Buddha was, uh, there is mention of the, the Gayatri Mantra uh, in, in, in the suttas even. So he says like of all, of all hymns or, or of all mantras, the Gayatri Mantra is, is the, the highest basically. And so he was aware of these, uh, uh, of these hymns and um, in the Gayatri Mantra there is a mention of uh, twice in there of the, the same root that is used as uh, jhana, which is dhi. Um, now I have to pull my Sanskrit out again. And I, I forget the Gayatri Mantra. Bhuva sva tat savitur vanediyam Yes, 
So that same root D is would be that uh, that same root for dhyana, and this is probably where the Buddha actually got that from. Because et- etymologically speaking, this is the only evidence uh, that we have that, the, and the Buddha liked to do that. He liked to implement uh, some of that knowledge into, turn it into what he understood, basically. So yeah. Like the word samadhi is another, he, it's another word that he came up with. It's not in the Vedas, so, mm-hmm. uh, uh, until later, too. Okay, uh, yes, and, you know, the Buddha, I, I really like this, this uh, story, uh, this analogy, where the Buddha was actually with, with uh, quite a few monks in the forest, and um, he grabbed a handful of leaves, and he said, what do you think, monks? Uh, what I, is there more leaves uh, in my hand or on the forest floor? And the monk said, Bhante, there's more leaves on the forest floor. And the Buddha said, well, it's the same thing for what I've taught you. I've only taught you this much. <laughs> and he said, the reason for that is because this is what you need to know to break through to awakening. There's so much to know in this universe. And the, this is why the Buddhas, like Samma, some Buddhas, like perfectly all, all awakened Buddhas who can teach the Dhamma. They've done this for so long and their wisdom is so vast and deep and far reaching. They've had to try everything basically to finally understand how it works. <clears throat> we, we're lucky. <laughs> we get a Buddha to tell us. <laughs> but the Buddha doesn't have a Buddha to tell him. That's why they're called the Buddha, basically. That's, that's what you need to, to be called a Buddha. Is you, you have to figure it out on your own. And then everybody else that comes after that um, gets, gets it from the Buddha. And there's far much more time without the Dhamma, without the Buddha, without the Buddha's teaching in this world, um, than, than times when there, there actually are. So we're very, very, very fortunate to have this uh, here and now. TK. <laughs> Let's share our merits, maybe, and then we can go. Okay. Right. And so, uh, Bhante Vimalaramsi, my teacher, would always uh, encourage people to sit in meditation after the talks, because meditation is especially good after hearing the Dhamma. So, I encourage everybody to do so. Also, please be kind with yourself. Uh, so I leave that in your hands, really. But just so you know, this is uh, it's a very good practice to have. So on this, we can take the book on page two. Two thirteen. Dukkha bhata chani dukkha bhaya bhata chani bhaya soka bhata chani soka ontu sabbe pipani no irang no punyang sabbe satta no morantu sabba sampatti siddhya aga satta chabu matta deva naga mahidika punyang tanganu moritwa Chirang Rakhantu Sambuddha Sasana. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, Share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Have a good evening and I'll see you tomorrow morning.